Parkinson's disease is a debilitating brain disorder. Dr. Alex Tagla is a neurosurgeon with the Orange County Neurosurgical Associates, and he's here to showcase a new treatment. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. So what exactly is uh, Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is a degenerative disease of the brain that is characterized by a few cardinal features. Uh, one is a resting tremor. The other is slowness of movement or bradykinesia. Uh, the other is rigidity. And some patients also have components of postural instability, balance, or gait difficulties as well. What do you mean by a resting tremor? Parkinson's disease has sort of a classic tremor. It's, it's a low frequency, meaning it's fairly slow, and it's a tremor that's present at rest. And uh, we, we've always called it a pill rolling tremor. Often patients get uh, like that. idiosyncratic movements of the hand, such as this. So if they move their arm, the tremor goes away, is that the idea? It's less prominent. Less prominent. But you see a lot of people have other types of tremors. What are those called? Right, so there's all sorts of different types of tremors. With Parkinson's, we call it a resting tremor, meaning it's present at rest. There's patients with postural tremors, which means that if they hold their arm in a fixed position, they have the tremor, or intention tremors, where if they try to do something like drink a glass of water or reach for something, they have a noticeable tremor. So when they pick up the glass, they'll be shaky like that. Exactly. So that's not a good thing for a neurosurgeon to have. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what causes Parkinsonism? Do we know the Parkinson's disease, I guess? Right, uh, with Parkinson's disease, the cause really isn't known. We know what happens in the brain, which is the, the area of the brain called the substantia nigra, which produces dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, degenerates. Now that's different, that's called idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which means we, we don't know what causes it. Now there's other types of Parkinsonism mm -hmm. uh, that can be caused by drugs or repetitive uh, hits to the head, but, but this is different than Parkinson's disease. Okay. So a neurotransmitter is, what is that? So it's a chemical in the brain that basically communicates uh, and tells other parts of the brain what to do. So people with Parkinsonism have too much of this or too little of this drug? They have not enough dopamine. Not, not enough. And so the drugs that um, you use for Parkinsonism, what do they do? So uh, there's a number of drugs for Parkinson's disease. Most of them are what we call sort of dopamine equivalent medications. And basically they're synthetic forms of dopamine that get into the brain. Uh, the most common one is called levodopa. Levodopa, and that's been around for? Probably about 40 years. Yeah, I remember, yeah, for at least 40 years. At least long. 40 years. So do we think that, um, is it age related? Is it, uh, we're having more people have it now because the population's aging, is that the right, idea? Right, certainly. Um, in general, the population, about a third of a percent of the population has Parkinson's disease. Once you reach age 60, about 1% of the population has Parkinson's disease, and at age 80, approximately 4% of the population has Parkinson's disease. So the treatment is medicine or surgical treatment, right? Right. Or both. Right. It's typically we start out with um, medical treatment, mm -hmm. and if the patients progress or the medications become less effective, then we offer surgical options. What do you do for the patients with this device here? So we do a procedure called deep brain stimulation, or DBS, and basically what this is, it's a sort of brain pacemaker. It delivers electrical impulses to the brain that can control the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Does it cause the release of that uh, dopamine from certain cells or just mimics the effect of that on the cell? It primarily mimics the effect of, of dopamine uh, and, and reconstitutes the normal functioning of the brain in the affected part. So can you show me this? This is the uh, electrode that goes in. It's a little tiny wire. Right, so this is the component that we place in the brain. It's a small electrode. We call it a uh, microelectrode or DBS electrode. And it has four active contacts. And each one of these is approximately half a millimeter apart. And they can stimulate spe very specific areas of the brain. And that is, when you say deep, so it's not on the very surface. How deep do you, is deep? Right. So it's basically towards the center of the brain. Of the brain. Yeah. And do you approach it from the back or the side? We or? usually approach it from the top and the front of the head, maybe about here. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do is, through a combination of imaging, we, we map out a very specific trajectory in order to not to damage any other parts of the brain. Uh -huh. So when you put that in, how you, you kind of know where you're going because of the CT scan that you use mm -hmm. or something, but is the patient awake or asleep? Or? So what we do is, before surgery, we obtain an MRI, and the MRI gives us a very good anatomical knowledge of the structures that we need to stimulate for Parkinson's disease. On the day of surgery, we obtain a CT scan 
with the patient in a, a type of frame that allows us to get very exact coordinates mm -hmm. of the location. Now, what makes this surgery somewhat unique is the patients are awake. And the reasons the patients are awake for this surgery is so we can listen to electrical recordings from their brain, and, and the patients need to be awake for that. And once we have a characteristic signature of, of the target, then we're able to know that we're in the right location. So it's, it's not that you, do you turn it on to see if their tremor goes away or anything like that while they're awake? Yeah, in, in, the in fact, room? we do. We, we do, do test uh, the, the uh, electrode intraoperatively to make sure that we're getting the benefits we want. How long does this take to do? I know there's a lot of setups out time, but right. actually your time putting it in. Yeah, probably the procedure itself uh, takes roughly three to four hours oh, really? for electro. Wow. Uh -huh. wow. Our pacemakers, we can program them externally, and I imagine you do the same thing with this. Right, exactly. So, is this uh, a programmer? We, we have uh, programmers. This is the uh, programmer we use in the office. Okay. And what it allows us to do is uh, basically set the patient's uh, voltage as well as the frequency of the stimulation and the exact location of stimulation to maximize their benefits. In addition, we give patients a programmer they can take home so they can switch the uh, stimulation on and off for when they need it and when they don't need it. Now, do you ever turn it off at night with, to save the battery life and things like that? Or Yeah, and a lot of patients, as long as their Parkinson's doesn't prevent them from sleeping, mm -hmm. will turn off the battery at night. Does this take care of all the problems with Parkinsonism, the, the tremor, the shuffling gait, and the slow movements, or just certain things? What does it do? So. Typically, we tell patients that the symptoms that get better with the medications will also get better with the surgery. Um, tremor, we can almost always help. Uh, and then uh, bradykinesia, bradykinesia, slowness of movement, slow movement, and the rigidity also improve. Uh, things that don't uh, consistently improve are typically the problems with gait or balance. Should this be started sooner in the course when you're, when you're first diagnosed with Parkinsonism? rather than drugs, or uh, what is the sequence of, of using this? Right, so traditionally, uh, we have placed the electrodes and done DBS when the patient uh, fails to respond to medication. So typically, the patients will have responded well to medications for a period of time, then either get side effects or less benefit from the medication. And one of the side effects we see is dyskinesias or uncontrollable movements with, with the medication. And typically, we've offered uh, deep brain stimulation at that point in the illness. There is some suggestion with early data that we may be uh, performing these earlier on in the course of the illness, but, but that remains to be seen. And so, they, so most people then are going to be on this plus the drugs. Right. But maybe you can reduce the drugs so you have less side effects from the drugs, and, uh, and then you can adjust this. Now, why would a patient want to adjust this? Is, is there some... If they're stimulated too much, is there some downside to that? So uh, we have, uh, sometimes with stimulation, we can have reversible side effects. The most common side effects that people get if we turn up the stimulation too high are either contractions or, or muscle contraction on one side of the body or numbness or tingling on one side of the body. Now those always go away once you turn the stimulation off but uh, it, that may be a reason to turn down the stimulation. We're just about out of time, but the future of this, do you think there's gonna be smaller electrodes or smaller batteries? What is the future of this technology? The future of this technology is, is, is twofold. One is the implanted devices are going to be better. There's going to be more contacts, there's gonna be smaller batteries, rechargeable systems, which are already available. But also, uh, there's gonna be expanding indications for deep brain stimulation. Right now, we do it for Parkinson's disease, tremors, dystonia and obsessive compulsive disorder. There's trials underway for Alzheimer's disease, obesity, epilepsy, Tourette's syndrome. And so that's really the future over the next 10 to 15 years. Wow, that's fascinating. So it's really going to expand. This is a fantastic technology and I really appreciate your coming. It was a great conversation. I learned a lot. I think the patients are going to learn a lot. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me.